Hello everyone, we're back. Uh, I'm Ariadne and we're today gay with our speaker, Shia Bastia. Uh, she's an international activist based in New York City and she also is from a, an indigenous clan, correct? And we're going to be talking about different topics, including indigenous uh, rights and indigenous strikes and what, how she feels about that. Want to tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Chie. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. I think that this type of conversations across the ocean are very important especially in times of the coronavirus pandemic when we feel so isolated. So yeah, as Ariana said, I am from the Otomi Toltec indigenous community, which is in Mexico. I was born and raised in Mexico and I lived there till I was 13 years old. So like most of my life, in my mind, I, am, I still live in Mexico, basically. Um, and now I'm in New York City because my parents got a job here. And I've been here for five years, going to college next year. So how are strikes in the U.S.? For example, I know in Greece, uh, we're also not only focused on systematic change, but also a lot on individual change. How is it in the U.S.? Um, in the U.S., I think that the messaging around climate from corporations had been the blame is on the individual if we have a climate crisis. Like if you didn't recycle, it's your fault that we are on a climate crisis. So we have been switching the messaging to, it's all about systematic change because you cannot expect me to recycle our way out of the climate crisis, but you can change all of your practices in your company or your business or like whatever sector you're part of. So we are focusing a lot on pushing systematic change through legislation, and obviously, we're still like changing all of our own habits as activists, but we don't emphasize individual change as much as systemic change because like things have to change at the root of the problem, not just like people reacting in the same systems that are causing the crisis. Of course, of course. And um, as I said before, I wanted to talk to you about also indigenous rights and the indigenous community. Um, how do you think that the world should react and help them? How do you think we can help them as people that are activists and want to help these indigenous fighters? Yeah, uh, for those who don't know, um, being an activist in Europe or in the US is so much easier than in any of the global South countries, especially if you're indigenous. And even in the US, if you're indigenous, it's still like really hard to be a, a climate activist. And this is mainly because all the companies that are destroying, you know, sacred lands and sacred, like, you know, forests and just, all of the patrimony that is cultural for us, uh, when people try to speak up and protect that, then they get shut down. So the fight is different because for us, it's more like an initiative, like as youth climate activists in the global north, it's more of like, we do this because we care about the planet, but we have to remember that for some people, it's a fight for their lives, a fight for their communities, a fight for their traditions. And when we think about how the fossil fuel industry impacts the world, it's not only through rising temperatures and rising sea levels, like that is the effects of the climate crisis. But we have to remember that the places in which these industries go to put their infrastructure is in indigenous land. They end up contaminating all the water and you know, depleting the ecosystems. So, if we want to help indigenous sovereignty, indigenous rights, we just have to recognize that indigenous philosophy, which is like so tied to the earth because of our traditions and culture, has to be the one leading the climate fight. Um, and it's hard, I think, because a lot of the times indigenous people are only invited into spaces 
for the public to see if that makes sense, like tokenizing indigenous people. And that cannot be the case. Like you cannot just ask indigenous people to come in when you have a webinar, but not include them in the decision making of whatever your organization does. And I'm not saying like, if you live in Greece, then get somebody indigenous from the US and ask them to join. It has to like, there's indigenous people all over the world in where, wherever you are. You just have to be conscious of it. Um, yeah, I don't want to like just keep going and going, but guys, respect indigenous rights. So for you, um, I think also a way to express that was your new campaign, uh, We the Planet. Uh, that you organized and that you made sure represents everyone in the world. Do you want to tell everyone a bit about that campaign? Yeah, so With the Planet is a campaign for Earth Day. So it's not designed to be like a long-term thing um, because we just wanted to make something truly international for Earth Day. And I, I think we did it. We got over 300,000 people from around the world who saw our campaign, which is insane. Like that's how many people we got to strike in New York for September 20th. And the thing with We The Planet uh, is that there's like another We The Planet that exists that's founded by Kunal Sood and Laura Murnaka who work at the UN. So they started We The Planet like back in September. Um, and I didn't know like they had trademarked it and whatever, so we can't go forward with our own name. But it was an amazing campaign. And we are actually gonna turn it into an organization, but with a different name. So I know this is gonna come out on Friday or like, pro when is it gonna come out? Uh, Monday. Monday, okay, so that's perfect. Because by then you'll know, but don't tell anybody right now. <laughs> um, we're launching our new, organization which is going to be called re-earth um with with the same uh with the planet team is focused on reconnection rethinking reimagining what the world can look like and it's international it's welcoming you can join us we love everyone <laughs> so go ahead and follow them on instagram twitter and facebook i guess yes at re.earth initiative and they also have a website go check it out right re-earth in re-earth in dot org okay so be sure to check that out um so i know that you're not only part of fff and re the planet or uh, re planet uh, you're also part of XR, the Sunrise Movement, and different movements in the U.S. How do you feel that different movements connect to different uh, topics? Do you feel like every movement is fighting for the same thing? I, I'm, of course, the end product, but in different ways, how do you feel that every movement is fighting? I think that in the U.S., we have a wide diversity of movements. Uh, and I think it's very important because if we didn't have Extinction Rebellion, then FFF would look radical in our demands. And Extinction Rebellion, they know that they're asking for a lot, but we need to expand our margin of what we're asking for. Then Sunrise Movement is more political. So they endorse candidates, they give them grades, which is awesome. Um, and they're mostly like college students or they're a little bit older than us. And then Fridays for Future focuses on organizing strikes. And then Earth Guardians focuses on uplifting indigenous voices. So I feel like this diversity of tactics that we have actually makes the movement stronger. Because we are still all united. When there's big strikes, we all work together. Because at the end of the day, we're just kids who want to make the world a better place. So even if we belong to different organizations, we all work together um and i say i'm part of all these movements because i've organized with them before and i don't think you, you need to have like a you know be a spokesperson for them all the time to say you're part of them because they're just so inviting that you can just say that you are um so i wanted to come back to your uh upbringing that was in mexico uh 
you left uh, not because of the flood that happened, but a flood happened that affected you uh, emotionally and physically. Um, do you want to say a bit about that and how you think that that influenced your activism? Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, because the media has always kind of said that I left my home because of the flooding that happened in my hometown. But that was just kind of a coincidence that the flood happened and I had to leave the next day. Uh, but nevertheless, it was still one of the most impactful things I've experienced because we had suffered drought for about two or three years. Uh, food prices had gone up because of the drought. Like just nothing was being, being able to be harvested and things like that. Uh, and then when the flood happened, it wasn't only like water. I feel like that would have been fine, but it was contaminated water because we had a river right next to there um, that all the factories in my community, because like it's a very low income community town in which most of the people, they work in factories. And we have two factories at the entrance of my town. Like it's really bad. And all the waste from there went to this like magnificent river that my dad used to be able to bathe in. And now like obviously we cannot even go next to it without like putting up our windows because it smells so bad. And when the flooding happened, all that waste, chemical waste from the factories went on the streets. And I think that like caused a lot of health problems for people. So it wasn't only like the immediate effect of the flood affecting stores and you know farmland and like ourselves but also like the longer term effect of the health problems that it brought how big is your town it's not that big you can probably drive through it in like 15 minutes and there are two big factories yeah it's crazy so right now, because of uh, the COVID, uh, we, everything's kind of on pause, I guess, for you as well. Um, did you have anything uh, kind of related, uh, planned for these months that we're in self-isolation? Yeah, I actually had a lot of events. Like, I had an event every week of March and April. Um, and obviously it all had to get canceled, right? Like, rightfully so. Right now I'm supposed to be in Texas in the Earth Tech Summit. And I was just like really looking forward to that. And then after that, I was going to go to Vancouver for my TED Talk that I was going to give. So there's just like all these really big milestones that I was really looking forward towards. Um, and they all got canceled. But I think that we have learned a lot from the coronavirus pandemic. Because in my opinion, every crisis can teach us something. And that's how we have to look at it in a positive way. I think the coronavirus pandemic has taught us about solidarity. It has taught us that my actions here affect you, even if you're all the way across the world. Um, and it has taught us that like millions of individual actions combined can create systemic change, which is something that the climate movement has been debating for a, whole, for a while whether like what's more important individual or systemic but enough individual create systemic um so it's definitely sad also my high school senior so my graduation and my prom got canceled which is really sad um but i think that this has also given us an opportunity to rethink our tactics like we've never done so many webinars or online stuff or Instagram takeovers or Instagram campaigns. Um, and I've met amazing people who I wouldn't have met otherwise. So next to all these webinars and talks that we're doing online, we're also doing the digital strikes. Uh, are you joining these? What do you think about these? How do you think they are affecting the people around them? And do you think that they will be they bring some kind of change or do you think it's more kind of showing solidarity? I think the digital strikes are not for other people. I feel like they're for us. They're for us to remind us that we have a community and that there's people there for us. 
and it's also for consistency. We want to show the world that even though we are in a, in a pandemic and we can't go out to the streets, we're still conscious about the crisis and we didn't let it go. Um, I don't think they do anything in terms of changing people's minds, which is why I think we're having webinars and why we're having, you know, talks for future and all those amazing things. Um, because posting a picture of you with a sign is not as strong as it is if you're in the street with millions of people. Um, so I definitely think it's important, um, but I don't think it's the only thing we can do. I know that you strike in New York, but also all around the U.S. there are strikes, right? Yes. Where is the biggest one? Uh, the biggest strikes when we organize them are usually in New York or in L.A. or in D.C. So all of these like big cities, that's when the, where the biggest strikes are. All the other strikes are like, I don't know, like maybe max 10,000, 20,000 people. But in New York, we got 300,000. And I think LA got like a similar number and DC as well. So they're like small compared to other countries, I think, uh, still, considering that we have like 300 million people in the US. Um, but they're really amazing. How do you plan to continue your activism in college? I know it's a, a big dilemma oh. for you. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I'm definitely going to continue my activism, but I cannot, you know, keep traveling and keep going on conferences all the time. Um, so I'm probably going to be more of like a local activist in Philly, which is where my college is. I'm just going to do a lot of like legislative work, probably a lot of like, you know, trying to get the city to transition to renewables, more of like local organizing, because I cannot take on international organizing, probably in college. So, um, I mean, the reason why I'm going to college is because I want my voice to become stronger because of the things that I'm going to learn. And I, in this world, sadly, you need to go to college in order for people to validate your knowledge, which I think it's, you know, it's good, but it's also crazy that they charge me so much money for that validation. So I'm like looking forward to it and I'm not going to leave my activism at all, but I'm not going to be able to do it as much. How would you encourage other young activists to uh, use their voice and to connect with people? I think that there's not one way to be an activist. Um, and I think that's like a big part that the media hasn't shown us because they show us that there's like, look at these five activists that are doing amazing things, right? Or four or like 10, whatever. And all of them kind of do the same thing. Uh, but I think that you can be part of the climate movement in whatever capacity you can and with whatever talents you have. So what um, the Earth Day campaign that we held has taught me was that we need people who can make amazing graphics. We need people who are really good at talking to people. We need people who are really good at, we're going to come out with a, like a whole album with songs, um, which is like really great. We need people to edit. We need people to handle social media. We need people to do the interviews. We have so many different roles in the movement. And that's why you are needed. Because all of us have different talents. We haven't talked about this, but how did you actually get into Phrase for Future? I know you're one of the main organizers in uh, NYC. So how did you start it? What was your thought behind um, yeah, I, I decided sometime in high school that I needed to do something, and that's, like, very vague. So I decided to become leader of my school's environmental club. Um, I started organizing kids to go up to our capital to lobby, and I was behind a lot of climate legislation that passed in the city, and I testified at City Hall so that the city would declare a climate emergency. So I was like kind of in the activism space already before I heard about Fridays for Future. So then I heard that Greta called for the first global climate strike on March 15th. 
And I decided, you know, politicians that I'm lobbying, just when I get reelected, they don't really care about what we're saying. So we definitely have to disrupt the system. Uh, so I organized my school for March 15th to strike. Um, and I got 600 kids to walk out with me, which is much more than I thought because I thought I would get like five and 600 walked out, which was like the most amazing thing I, that ever happened. Um, and ever since I met a lot of the other organizers from other schools on the street and we decided to get connected and start Fridays for Future NYC. Do you want to add anything maybe about... Talk a bit more about the indigenous rights. I know you took yourself off. So if you want to talk about that a bit, that would be great. Yeah, um, I think that in this movement, especially right now, it has been seen, like a lot of people don't want to join it or whatever that means because they think it's too elitist or too white or too, you know, and when we were deciding our demands, for the September 20th climate strike, somebody said we should include protect biodiversity and oceans or something like that. And somebody said, no, we can't do that. That's like a white thing to ask for. And I was like, no, protecting biodiversity is an indigenous thing to ask for. Because like, I'm sure you've heard the statistic, but like, Indigenous people are 5% of the population on the earth and protect 80% of the biodiversity. I think that's like, everybody knows that. Like, if you don't know that, you, you now do. Um, so I was so shocked when people are like, you know, bringing all these like racial things into the movement when what we all want is just a better planet. Um, but I definitely think that the misconception that indigenous people are not present or are not, because when you hear indigenous people, a lot of people in the U.S. mainly hear something that's been already, like something ancient, something that's like in the past. They disregard that indigenous people are here right now and still doing work to protect their lands. So like there has to be a lot of re-education in the movement especially i think um and we just have to become more aware of the spaces that we have been taking up that other people have been speaking up for for so long and also like you said before it's important to not think that indigenous people are only those people in the u.s that we have indigenous people all around us and uh, we need to help them because of exactly what you said they're five percent of the population and protect 80 percent of the biodiversity which is huge yeah that's it thank you so much for joining us and uh, talking to me i hope you don't get sick and stay healthy and <laughs> i hope you can continue your projects and go to college for real on your first semester <laughs> thank you i really hope so thank you so much for having me how can an activist continue activism during quarantine? So there's lots of things you can do. One of them might be getting involved in digital actions such as Twitter storms with groups such as Polluters Out. There are a lot out there which you can get involved in. Another thing you can do is join in with the um, digital strikes every Friday and how you participate is you get your climate sign and you put it on social media with the hashtags hashtag climate strike online or there may be different hashtags um depending on where you are but ask your local group um and also i think it's really important to strengthen our communities and internal networks in this time so when we come out of lockdown we are ready to take action again and even though it may seem like we have lots of time to do all of this coordination and be really busy it's also important to take this time for ourselves and to rest and regenerate because this time is really difficult for lots of people um and yeah we need to come back stronger because otherwise yeah um so yeah and also another thing you can do is, is now you may have more time on your hands and if you're lucky enough to have that 
you could look into more environmentally friendly options um, such as you could try reducing your meat and dairy consumption uh, you could see you could spend some time researching where if you earn money where you put your money such as putting it maybe putting it into banks who um, who invest in fossil fuels um, yeah those are some things you can do so since every crisis has to be taken as a crisis it is important to continue climate activism even during these times depending on your local FFF group the options are different many FFF groups have online strikes and campaigns that you can join if you want more information you can contact them for example on social media or other platforms we don't want to go back to business as usual this is why we need to stay active <laughs>